welcome and I congratulate all of you who are here at 8 o'clock in the morning on, on the second day of the conference. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all. Uh, now, I collaborated on this talk with uh, an Indian colleague, which w will be familiar to many of you, Dr. Raman Um and he couldn't come, but I'm presenting on behalf of both of us. And basically, uh, I'll be giving a talk on some of the international uh, views that women have on the penis, um, a little bit about the Indian male reality, Indian Women in Australia survey, which Vijay uh, and I did, uh, some future directions as I see them, so, and some clinical considerations for a ver variety of penile uh, shapes and sizes, and a little bit for what I see in the future. So I hope I have enough time to cover all of that. So when we think about the penis, what is really the important factor? Uh, is it the appearance of it, the size of it, or really the function of the penis? Because one of the things we often forget is that the penis and sexuality is not a recreational goal. We're just mammals, and our genitals are there, and the way that we designed to function is really about procreation. So when men are anxious about it, when women are anxious about it, where is the reality perspective on that? So what is the importance? How the penis looks to other men? And this will be more a Western thing as, as boys get changed and uh, go for swimming or after sports and you might look across and see another boy's penis, you know, how you compare. Is that what's important? Uh, is it important how it looks to your female partner or is it important how it works functionally? So all of these things have to be taken into perspective. So often when I come to these conferences, it's a male talking about the penis from the male perspective. But most men are heterosexual and they're having sex with women. So what is it that women really think about the penis and what do they want from the penis or is it the man who's attached to the penis? And that's an important consideration. And this will be different from each woman. So we do tend to generalise. We talk about women, but it's not women globally. It's each woman, because each woman will be different, each man will be different, and each relationship and the sexual relationship will be different. And I think that's important to consider for sex therapy, which is hopefully what we're all doing here. And my ultimate goal from this talk is to kind of see if we can make men more relaxed with the genitalia, because I think a relaxed man makes a much better lover. And I think most women would like better lovers. So it's about reassuring men and women about what can be done so they get the best out of their sexuality rather than being focused on an anatomical parameter. Now, most of us would, have, would know this saying, 10 foot long, hard as steel and lasts all night long because it comes from a guru, Bernie Zilbergeld, um, who was very much in the forefront when I was growing up and training in sexuality. And I would defy any man in his heart of hearts not to want this. It's unrealistic, it's crazy. No woman wants a 10-foot penis that lasts like a machine going all night long. But I bet every man in this room, in his heart of hearts, thinks that that's a wonderful ideal and, and he's not big enough and strong enough and doesn't last long enough and, and this is what he wants. And yet it's crazy, absolutely crazy. But it's there. It pervades the atmosphere and we all absorb that and kind of believe it. So we know from research that most men show significant dissatisfaction with their penile size despite the fact that if you ask them, they say, yes, I'm average. We know that men who are less satisfied have higher sexual health problems. The, we have so much literature if you Google small penis syndrome. Um, and we, you know, pornography is pervasive now. Uh, even in India, I would expect that the majority of men have viewed pornography at some time. And these men are chosen for the size of their genitals. But, you know, for instance, in the Western world, we know that children 
Boys uh, as young as 10 and 12, about 90% of boys have seen pornography. And they compare themselves to the, these supersized uh, gentlemen and how it affects them. And then, of course, there's increased marketing of penile enhancement gadgets. So that the message is that bigger is better. So we kind of swim in this milieu of this bigger, better, harder, longer. Um, but what is the goal of that? And being too small is very humiliating in all cultures. If you look at erotica from around the world, South America, these beautiful pottery jugs with these huge penises. If you look at the Japanese erotica with, with the large phallus. India, if you look at Indian erotica, you know, the, the big phallus is uh, perceived as better. So having a small penis is humiliating for most men. And the large penis is associated with all sorts of things, the self-esteem, the confidence to engage in lovemaking and seek sexual activity and explore sexual activity. And the reality is that if you practice, you do become better at it. So it's got a kind of a feedback mechanism that a man with genitals he doesn't perceive as very effective will experience fewer sexual experiences, will practice less and, of course, be less good at it. So it's self-fulfilling. Uh, a large penis is seen as uh, someone who's fertile. And of course we know that fertility has got nothing to do with the size of your phallus. But overall masculinity and the confidence in the business world to go forward and be more successful uh, and better mental health outcomes. So, you know, there is a relevance to understanding how men experience their penis size. And we know that a big component of male dissatisfaction is actually what men think that women want, and hence the point of my talk. There's all sorts of available data on Indian men's penile size, and VJ did a, a dissertation for his PhD. And the average flaccid length by investigator was 8.21 centimetres, and circumference was 9.14 centimetres which, you know, is a fairly respectable functional length. And, you know, I won't read all of these, but you can look it up later on. So, really, I'm coming back now to women, which is the point of my talk. And, firstly, a little review. And, you know, you can look up these references at your own leisure later. So, Armstrong said, women are more orgasmic in stable relationships. So they focused on the psychological connection that women will have with the man who's attached to the penis. So the penis size itself is not the relevant factor. Uh, that study found that greater girth gave more erotic stimulation, but on the other hand, if the girth is too big, there was a risk of infection. So, um, sorry, injury and infection. So, he found that women would prefer less masculinity so that a smaller penis in a longer-term partner. Costa, increased rates of vaginal orgasm and higher sexual satisfaction with a longer penis. Dixon, average-sized flaccid penises were more attractive than the largest and the smallest. So here there's preference for average-sized penises. Eisman, preferred girth, his women preferred girth over length for sexual satisfaction. Wide variety of preferences. Lang, I put this study in because it's very interesting. Men tend to be more visual. Uh, hence, erotica for males has been much more successful than erotica for females. In, in fact, where they've put out magazines of nude men for women, the magazines have gone bust because women weren't particularly attractive to this kind of erotica. So, the men project the way they think onto women because men will study a, na a naked woman much more erotically than a woman will study a naked man. They then project that women will find that erotic in themselves and that's not true. In fact, I often say to my... If I have a couple in front of me and I'll turn to the husband and I'll say, you know, if a naked woman came in here, you would check out her genitals. If a naked man came in here, your wife and I would look at him 
and ask him if he was cold. And that's the difference between men and women. So men will tend to look at the whole man, not his genitals, whereas a man will tend to zero in visually on the breasts and on the pubic area. And it's important that men understand that there is that difference. Uh, Franchin, there was no difference in the sexual response of women who said they liked a large penis as opposed to women who said they liked an average penis. And Lever, uh, 85% of women were satisfied with their partner's penis, but in that study, 45% of the men were dissatisfied. So once again, it highlights that men are often dissatisfied with their genitals where the woman thinks they're absolutely fine. Uh, just a couple more. Uh, Prowse, women uh, preferred a slightly larger than average penis for casual sex, but an average penis for long-term sex. And what came out of that, that study is that for casual sex, the erotic component of the novelty and the variety and the tension of a new partner compensated for the uh, sexual lovemaking techniques and the penis of the man. But in a longer term relationship, you actually want the mental psychological connection to the partner and the genitals themselves take less importance. So once again, we're going to look at this, uh, the genital size of different relevance depending if it's a one-off casual or short-term relationship where the erotic component of the novelty compensates for things? Or do you want a long-term, stable, happy relationship where the psychological connection is more important? And Reinhold highlighted the fact that in different situations, different factors apply. So it's not a one-size-fits-all when we're talking about penis size. So coming to my study, and what I discovered that is that even in Australia it's very difficult to do sexuality studies, and our original aim was actually to have a cohort in Australia, a cohort of Indian women living in Australia, and a cohort of Indian women in India. And despite our best efforts for 12 months, we couldn't get the Indian cohort. Uh, and even in Australia, we didn't have a very high response. So it is difficult to do sexuality studies and it was an interesting experience for me. In our study, the average age was 35. They were a tertiary educated group as a whole in stable uh, relationships, um, mostly born in India in a cosmopolitan upbringing. So they weren't an average population to start off with. Uh, their preferences were for both thickness and length overall. Um, did you think the size of the penis was important to your sexual enjoyment? Most said yes. But once again, what I realised retrospectively was I didn't stipulate where the size cutoff was. So it was too general a question to actually draw a proper conclusion. What about the length of your, the penis? And here, surprisingly, quite a significant proportion, nearly 50% said they didn't care. Do you like the look of your penis? The majority said yes, uh, of the penis that your partner has, yes. Is your current partner happy with his penis? So, interesting enough, if you add the maybe and don't know, you get a significant percent which indicates to me that maybe the couple didn't talk about it very much. What do you think about the thickness? And interesting enough, in this group, contrary to what the international data showed, they didn't care about the thickness so much. When, what I was interested in is how this reflected in terms of relationship happiness. Was it really relevant the views that the women had specifically on the penis. And in this group, most were happy with their partner, they were happy with their sex life, although, you know, when you add the OK and the no, that's not an insignificant uh, percentage, so we're starting to get some schisms there. 
Most were orgasmic with their partners, which I thought was a higher than average community um, response. Uh, most liked intercourse, but you know, when you add the sometimes in the no, then 20%, that's one in five, didn't. Pain with intercourse was actually quite significant, which surprised me given the high orgasmic and the liking intercourse results. Uh, concerns with sex life, 40%. Now that's very high given that there was such a high response to orgasmic rates um, and liking intercourse. And 35% um, nearly had sought help for their sex life, which to me was a, a higher than average response. So when I looked at this data retrospectively, I came to the conclusion that I perhaps didn't format a very good survey and that really you need much more detail um, than this kind of uh, internet-based survey can, can give. So um, I don't know what you, that you can take very much away from this survey, but it was interesting results to, to ponder. And I suspect that um, these highly educated Indian-born women living in Australia um, perhaps don't reflect the sort of uh, average Indian woman living in, in India. But I would have liked to have that Indian data. So if anybody would like to do some, uh, some research in India, I'm very happy to collaborate from Australia. So coming to more clinical perspective, because I think that that's really where we need to go um, with this kind of data, to reflect on it and to see what's really necessary. So what do me, women really want from their lover? What do women really want from sex and what do they need to get it? So I think we need to realise that for good enough sexual function, women do need some biological integrity. So we need sexual health physicians who will examine the, the genitals, be realistic about the function and be able to give good information to women about how do you maintain good gentle health. Uh, you need psychological integrity. So you do need to, to be healthy, not to be anxious, not to be stressed. Uh, some sexual competence. As human beings, do any of us like doing anything that we feel we're not good at? No, if we feel we're not good at something, we'll tend to avoid it. Now, I don't know any activity where you can get better at it by avoiding it. So, it, once again, it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy that if you avoid sexual behaviour and don't engage actively in it, seeking information, practising, correcting mistakes, you're actually never going to get better at it. And we need to teach people that you, you're not going to be good at sex from the beginning that it's actually a physical activity that you need to practice doing. But in the practicing, there's no point practicing something bad. You actually need perhaps some external help to correct you, to guide you, to present opportunities for how it might be done differently. And that's education, whether it's written, whether it's from your parents, whether it's from a doctor, whether it's the sexuality educator. Sexual activity, like any other human activity, is a learned behaviour and we need external help. We're not born with the knowledge. We're born with the instinct to be sexual but we're not born with the knowledge of how to do it well. We have to be taught that and it's so important that we make sexuality education a valid part of education, of bringing up adults who are functional in society and who know how to uh, live happy lives. We need a good enough relationship it's absolutely crazy to expect to have good sex in a bad relationship. It's, it, that, that's a crazy position to be in. So you can't nag a woman into good sex. You can't beat a woman into having good sex. You can't guilt a woman into having good sex. You can guilt and beat her and nag her into lying there like a dead fish and you do whatever you want to do but you're not going to have good sex for yourself. Expectation of sexual pleasure. So no woman is going to want to have repeated activity where she has no expectation of sexual pleasure for herself. That, that's once again a crazy position. You need a partner who's attractive enough. 
you know, in, in the Western world especially, it's the woman's job to look attractive, to be fit, to be slim, to put on the negligee and the perfume and, and all of that. And what, the man can come home with a beer gut and smelling of beer and, and roll into bed with her and she's supposed to find him erotically attractive? No. Both genders are responsible for looking after themselves physically and emotionally to be an attractive partner that your partner wants to have sex with you. That's what we all need to do. And we need to teach young people, both men and women, that that's a responsibility. You don't have good lifetime sexuality with no effort. And environmental safety. You know, if you're at risk of being flooded out, if you're at risk of going hungry, if you're at risk of being evicted from your home, uh, you know, if your children are sick and you've got no means of looking after them, you haven't got the environmental safety in which to have good sex. And women especially, um, women are very broad and very general, we multitask, so women will be conscious of all sorts of, of factors when they engage in lovemaking and that channeling, that narrowing of focus into erotica is much more difficult for most women than it is for men. Uh, I say men are like hunters, they zero in on the animal and that's their goal. Whereas women are gatherers, you know, there's a carrot over there, there's a saber-toothed tiger over there, there's a kid falling into a pond here. And women scan the environment more often. So if women find it harder to focus in on becoming sexually aroused, their minds are too busy. So you need to have those good conditions for a woman to be consistently erotically aroused in a long-term relationship. And that's something that women have to learn and practice as well as all that, you need a sexually competent lover. Someone who's clumsy, who's awkward, who's hesitant about lovemaking will distract the woman from that erotic focus. And all of that is put together into a woman having sexual motivation. And here where, you know, I often talk to people that men and women are different. Men with their testosterone loading will be able to focus in on that erotica and screen out the world. Women have very little testosterone and a woman by the time she's 40 will have half of what she had when she was 20. So women really need that whole environment in which to maintain that erotic interest. And that's what I call sexual motivation. And the sexual motivation is, uh, you know, all of that that you actually want to make love to your partner because it's worthwhile making love to. That person is worthwhile making love to. And that's that sexual motivation that comes from all of that put together. So most women, as they age, are not responding to a biological hormonal drive. Most women are responding intellectually because it makes sense to make, lover, make love to that lover. So men need to be aware of all those factors that women need for good lovemaking. Now I think Masters and Johnson caused a lot of confusion because what they posited was that a woman's vagina will accommodate itself to every penis and the penis has no true physiological effect on female sexual function. That's rubbish. Of course the penis has an effect. And yes, the vagina will accommodate itself, but that doesn't necessarily translate to sexual erotica and sexual satisfaction. So common sense would determine that, of course, the size of the penis matters. And I think we do a disservice to the argument when we say that it doesn't. So we've got to be realistic and we've got to talk about the range. So the reality is that a shorter than 8 centimetre penis length is problematic because you can't thrust, you'll pop out. And if you're clumsy with it, then the chances are you'll um, either, you, you can even fracture your penis because you'll hit it on one of the pubic bones 
Um, but it's kind of annoying during lovemaking to be popping out of the, the vagina. So, yes, it does cause a problem. And it need, but it's not the end. You know, you don't, when a patient comes to you, a client comes to you, you don't say, well, this is how it is. Then you think about how do you compensate for that, that clinical situation. And you need to think about the position. So, for instance, the woman being on top and rocking on the penis is likely to be much more satisfactory than the missionary position where the penis is popping out and you're trying to fit the penis back in. Um, weight control may be an important factor. So if you tend to be a little bit plump with a, with a tummy, that's going to distance the two uh, pubic areas. So a shorter penis is going to be a disadvantage. So you know, making sure that you're trim is going to be helpful. Elevating the, the woman's pelvis by popping a pillow underneath so that she's got a little bit of tenting uh, and makes the you know, labial area more accessible might be helpful. Uh, you, know, you, you think about compensatory techniques and not to be embarrassed to talk about the practicalities because our patients, if they haven't had much sexual experience, won't think of these very simple, obvious ways of helping themselves. And then, there, of course, there are some beautiful toys around. And if they're not available, then you go on the internet and you get them sent to you. I don't know if India Post screens um, erotic toys and stops them coming in. Do they? They do. They won't let them come in. Okay. Then you go overseas and buy yourself one or ask a relative <laughs> to buy one for you. But there are some beautiful silicon strap-on toys now so that if you want a little bit of variety and to have that experience of perhaps having a longer penis, then there'll be the strap-ons, there'll be the penile extenders that cause no harm whatsoever. They're just a recreational variety to add to the lovemaking. But, you know, you tell your patients that they're available. And, of course, the, to talk about the, the bigger weighting given to outer course as opposed to intercourse. Even a, a smaller than 8 centimetre penis, the fertility is not impaired. From the biological perspective, the man is 100% male. He can impregnate a female. Nature is satisfied with procreation. Now we're talking about recreation. And what is recreation in lovemaking? It's two people being together who want to give each other pleasure and fun. You know, that erotic component of being with someone who wants to touch your skin because they get pleasure out of it and they want to give you pleasure. And the whole body is an erotic zone. It's not just the genitals. And it's having humour in the situation, having variety in the situation, a little bit tension and surprise in the situation. So most of us are making love for recreation. And you don't need intercourse and thrusting in the big picture of that recreation. So it's about helping men and women where the man might have a small penis to see the big picture. Because as human beings, when we have a problem with a part of our anatomy, it's like we stop being a whole person, we're only that bit of anatomy. So, you know, if someone feels they have a big nose, all they see as they look around is their own big nose. They don't see themselves as in balance with the, the whole picture. Uh, they did some research where they put those kind of goggles on women to see where the eyes focus. And then they got the woman to identify a body part that she didn't like. And they found that as these women walked around, every shop front, every mirror they saw, all they did was they saw the part of the body they didn't like. So they kept reinforcing to themselves that they were unattractive. And I think that's what happens you know, with men if they have a, a penis they don't like. All they think about is this little bit of anatomy, not the whole picture. So it's about making outer course, which is oral sex, manual sex, vibrator sex, masturbation, either parallel, so it's the two people masturbating themselves while they're together, or mutual masturbation, um, attractive recreational activities. So these two people are doing something with each other, which in a monogamous relationship they wouldn't be doing with anyone else, which is a very special gift, doing it with fun, with lightness, with laughter, with humour, 
to give each other pleasure. Now, what can be better than that? And yes, intercourse is a component of lovemaking, but it's really important that we put into perspective that it's not the be-all and end-all. So, let's move along. What about a very thin penis? Of course a very thin penis is not going to stretch the introitus the same way as a, a thicker, plumper penis. So what can you do? That's actually quite a, a, a simple one. You need a prosthetic aid, like a, um, a masturbator or, or a silicon sheath, and I'll show you a picture, to give you that girth. And the same, for instance, if a woman's had a lot of children and her vagina is lax, then the penis might be an average size, but still they're not getting the friction from the stretch because of her vaginal laxity. And you might use a prosthesis like this. And you might talk about the position, like riding high, where the man is up further, so that there is more stretch on the introitus. And of course, you know, teaching people kegels exercises. I don't know if when women go to maternity hospitals here that's automatically taught. The Western experience is that women are taught the Kegels exercises. As soon as they leave the maternity hospital, they stop doing them. So I don't know. And what I say to people, to men and to women, so I hope everyone in the audience at this moment is doing a pelvic floor exercise, is uh, that you should be doing them for life. It's like brushing our teeth for dental hygiene. There's, and because in Sydney we, we drive a lot and we have a lot of red lights, I tell people that at every red light for the rest of your life, you do pelvic floor exercises. They don't cost anything. You don't have to see anyone for it. They don't hurt. But the sexual benefits for men and for women are huge. And yet it's a, such a simple thing and we don't encourage people enough to do it. Hmm? So what are some of the sexual aids that I'm talking about? So a strap-on or an extender... I don't have a, uh, a laser here. Uh, the, the little blue gadget is, uh, you know, to increase the girth of a, of a penis. The little donut ring in the left-hand corner there, uh, it's then what, something that I might recommend for a, a long uh, penis to limit the degree of penetration so the woman's not hurt. Um, and the little silicon collection there uh, are silicon tubes that basically um, can either help with the rigidity of the penis, can help with the girth of the penis, uh, and increase overall sensation. And they're just such simple, inexpensive, harm-free, you know, prosthetics. So with a larger penis, it can in the long term be more pro problematic because it's, it's easier to add something for a small penis than it is to take away from a large penis. And if a woman is not aroused enough so that she's dry and her pelvic organs haven't uh, moved away from the vagina, she will be hurt. And I think that's one of the problems that longer-term relationships have when uh, a man has a larger penis. Early on in the relationship where there's a lot of erotica and a lot of focus on sexuality, so the women are aroused, it's all comfortable. Uh, the couple is now married, getting into a, a longer-term relationship. They're perhaps having sex very late at night after all the duties have been done. There's perhaps been a little bit of an argument, a little bit of resentment. Um, everyone's a little bit tired. Not enough foreplay has taken place. The woman's not aroused enough, so she's not lubricated enough and her pelvic uh, genitalia hasn't uh, prepared for intercourse, she starts becoming sore. Next time she makes love, she remembers that last time she was a little bit sore. She's, remember, you have to have the expectation of pleasure, but now you've got the expectation that something was uncomfortable and painful. So is she letting herself go? No, she's a little bit tentative, a little bit guarded. If you're tentative and guarded, are you going to become more aroused? Hmm. So, very subtly into the relationship is being built in the dynamic of not looking forward to lovemaking, not being aroused enough, becoming a bit painful, you don't have your orgasm. Why do you want to do it? 
any sensible woman wouldn't want to do it because it's not satisfactory. And so it gets built into the relationship. It's not something the couple does consciously. They don't understand that this is happening, but yet this is the dynamic that I see in so many of my couples that I see. So that larger penis, yes, you know, in a short-term relationship with high erotica, it's okay. But in a longer-term relationship, you have to become a little bit more knowledgeable and to make sure that the woman is properly aroused or that, you know, a situation of not expecting pleasure will build into the relationship. Margaret, so, we have five minutes more. Yep, I'm um, coming along. So uh, that was that donut that I uh, showed you. And placing the donut at the base of the penis for a long penis will limit that degree of penetration uh, and may make it more comfortable. So quickies aren't going to be the go for a man with a larger penis. Now, one of the things I might ask you to consider is, does it help a man with a smallish penis to be told that he's in the average range? No, it doesn't. So I'll just leave that. So once again, when you're seeing these couples, it's about seeing where is the problem. Is it with the flaccid penis? Is it with the erect penis or with both? Is the problem his or hers? and to treat each man and woman and couple as individuals because their um, anxieties will all be a little bit different within a, a, a major framework. So the questions that need consideration, you know, what do women really want? How do the women choose their partners? Uh, when a woman is considering a lifetime partner, is the size of the penis a major consideration? Uh, or, you know, uh, and I often say to women, women are carers to a large degree, and a man having a vulnerability, but letting her in to help him is actually very erotic for most women. Uh, so that having a sexual difficulty uh, may not be a major deterrent. Uh, and I think most women want a lover rather than a penis. So they're looking for the man that's attached to the genital. Someone who cares for them, someone who will consider them, provide for life uh, with her interest uh, at heart and will listen to her. So the personality um, is much more important than the genitals. And I say to men, you can be a fantastic lover with no genitals at all. Because the reality is that most women get sexually aroused through external stimulation of the clitoris. Uh, and not the vaginal stimulation. The vagina is a relatively insensitive organ, as we heard uh, yesterday. And that, to a large degree, penis size can be compensated for if you're able to talk about it freely. So it's about looking what you can do rather than what you can't do. And the reality is that none of us here have everything in life that we want. And that happy people are the ones who celebrate what they do have and then try to compensate for what they don't have. So in conclusion, I don't believe that a woman's enjoyment of sex and overall sexual satisfaction is based only on penis morphology. But as physicians, we do have to be realistic and that there are some penile shapes and sizes that you know, uh, detract from good sex. And it's about looking ways medically and non-medically to compensate for that. And I believe that men and women need help to be able to discuss their gentle concerns respectfully with health professionals and to be guided in their appropriate action because they don't have that knowledge, really simple things, um, to know which direction to go in to help themselves. And I believe that a woman's global enjoyment and satisfaction is heavily influenced by the man's response to his own perceived prowess. So that when a man has an unsatisfactory sexual response like premature ejaculation or retarded ejaculation or his genitals are, he perceives as not being attractive, I believe that what the men do is they actually withdraw from the partner. And most women don't think, oh, he's withdrawing because he's embarrassed about himself. They think he's withdrawing because I'm not attractive enough. And when she thinks that he's withdrawing from me because I'm not attractive enough or he doesn't love me, what does she do? 
she withdraws. And you have a, a, a couple that's incrementally withdrawing from each other. And they could have been a lovely couple who loved each other and would have had a really good love, a life together if they could have been prevented from those errors, that miscommunication, misunderstanding of each other. So we need to help men and women accept their genitals. And you can only do that through education. And human beings educate verbally. So we need verbal uh, education. We need to help people broaden their sexual scripts because sexuality is a learned behaviour. As I said, the instinct to have sex is biological. How we have sex is a learned behaviour. And human beings are the only mammals who hide sexual behaviour and yet ex expect extraordinary ability, knowledge and prowess from sexual behaviour. Every other mammal on earth watches and learns sexual behaviour in its peer group because sex isn't hidden among other mammals. But human beings hide sexuality and then expect amazing things from it. It's crazy. So I believe that couples would have better sex lives if men had decreased anxiety over their penile appearance, size and ability if there was increased awareness of women's sexual satisfaction beyond the penis and intercourse, and there was decreased association between penis size and manhood, masculinity and fertility. Thank you. <laughs>